Could we please um, take our seats? And um, I, I didn't know, Amandeep, that, that my opening remarks were going to be consecutive to a previous panel. Uh, but uh, in any case, <laughs> here we go, and uh, the call of duty. Um, it's great to be here with Amandeep and the uh, impressive uh, members of the uh, Secretary General's Advisory Board. I think that they, they have uh, triggered a conversation that is necessary. You have seen in the previous panels how much there is movement. There is not lack of movement in terms of what should be doing with these technologies. And that was exactly the call that Secretary General posed to uh, all of us, the members of the UN system. And therefore, I'm not going to repeat uh, what we have been discussing uh, related to the role of, the, of UNESCO. But I want to say first that uh, we welcome this exercise and, and, the, and the, the, the work that, uh, that, of course, our Take Envoy is uh, doing, and also because it's going to lead to members uh, engaging in the digital compact and in the f summit of the future. And therefore, it's a process. It's a process that's going to deliver uh, very interesting outcomes. I just want to bring to your attention uh, something else because uh, the, the, the UN system has also this space where we all coordinate together that uh, has the name of High Level Committee of Programs. In that uh, setting, UNESCO and ITU are uh, co-chairing the Task Force on Artificial Intelligence. And we just wanted to put, because of course the experts here have a, a very impressive career on artificial intelligence, but, but they are no experts of the UN system, and therefore nobody expects you to become experts of the UN system. Uh, for that, uh, ITU and, uh, and UNESCO uh, produced two reports, because we ask all of the 45 uh, UN institutions to inform this debate uh, what are the contributions that they are doing to the governance of AI, because that's a question. And let me tell you that I was very proud, because many times we hear, well, international institutions, they should be faster, they should be nimble, they should be uh, more effective in their, in their deer, uh, deeds. Uh, but I really found that uh, many institutions are taking the challenge of artificial intelligence and uh, providing with very concrete solutions. This is the report that we sent to you, uh, Amandeep, uh, early, early December or, or last December, but we are condensing it into something that is more readable. Uh, but at the end, uh, you can look down, for example, whenever we talk about the amazing progress that uh, the health sector is doing with artificial intelligence in terms of diagnostics, in terms of analysis, we would have never had a vaccine in one year if it was not for the power of artificial intelligence during COVID. So we can see the unfolding of the protein. We would have taken 20 years to get into that if we didn't have these amazing capacities of artificial intelligence. But the WHO is on top of it, and they're really looking into these issues. UNEP is using all the uh, uh, technologies they can uh, get into understanding the weather, into understanding the disaster risk management, and, and therefore I think this is uh, the, 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 the contributions that each one of them uh, can make. And then, of course, uh, we are proud that uh, with our standard setting role, because not all institutions have this standard setting role, we are contributing to how to frame this debate in an ethical manner, because this is the reflection that we all uh, should have. So these are our contributions. But we are also proud that we have here with us uh, the Tech Envoy with the, with the advisors, that we will be hearing from them in terms of their reflections and the report that they produce. And that, of course, I'm sure that you are expecting a good exchange with the public and with all these participants that are joining us. So with uh, nothing uh, more to add, I, I leave you with uh, this fantastic panel. Thank you. Gabriela, for uh, the welcome and for the introductory remarks. Uh, it's been a long day, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm sure you have AI coming out of your ears. So uh, we will try and uh, make it snappy. And I'll use some slides uh, so that we can um, uh, be more efficient 
with the use of our time. So slides to just present to you the background on the advisory body before we get into um, a conversation with the five members who've joined us uh, today. Uh, you saw four of them yesterday at the discussion in the afternoon, and I want to welcome Professor Arisa Emma, uh, who's come from Japan to uh, join us um, today. So if I could have the slides up. And thank you, Gabriela, for mentioning uh, the importance of understanding how the UN system, how multilateral institutions function and sometimes not, not function. Um, so um, that is uh, kind of our role at the Tech Envoy's office to bring in that understanding from you, the UN system into the work of the advisory body. Uh, in my own work on studying uh, the evolution of international institutions over the years in the nuclear domain, I've realized that what matters is the uh, competence of the secretariat, the knowledge that the secretariat brings in, nuanced knowledge, uh, contextual understanding of what is at stake, and a kind of systemic memory uh, so that member states can be helped, can be guided uh, in their policy making uh, work. And a couple of things I emphasize to my colleagues in the UN system is when it comes to AI, please look carefully into the use cases. Does this require a machine learning solution or can it be handled by other means? Uh, simple digital techniques, uh, simple apps, data analytics. Uh, don't just say AI because it's the buzzword. Uh, and the other thing I want to emphasize is uh, that there should be no tech solutionism. And most of our problems are in the analog world, in fact, all of them. Most of the solutions also lie there. Uh, and we shouldn't anthropomorphize uh, AI, nor treat it as a magic wand to solve our problems. Now, why a high-level advisory body on AI? So there is a global imperative. Uh, we need to harness AI for humanity. If it is indeed such a powerful technology, then the entire humanity should be involved in that uh, conversation, not only on the risks and the challenges, but also the opportunities, and importantly, the enablers needed to realize uh, those opportunities. As AI spreads across the globe, uh, its impact is also spread. You know, so what happens in one jurisdiction may have impact in another jurisdiction. You need to coordinate uh, globally, and that's why the Secretary General convened this advisory body to undertake analysis and advance recommendations for the international governance of AI. It's plenty happening at the national layer, a uh, lot happening at the industry layer, self-regulation, responsible practices, but what is it that we need to do at the international uh, level? If you go to the next slide, you'll see who the members of the advisory body are. You see five of them here. 39 members, all experts in their relevant domains, representing diverse perspectives, all the five UN regional groups, 33 nationalities, gender balance, 20 women, 19 uh, men. Let's go to the next slide. And what has it done so far? So uh, starting in October, it divided its work uh, into five areas. They are listed here uh, and got to work. And these working groups formally met 40 plus times. In formal interactions, we've counted, uh, you know, short calls more than 400. Uh, and then they had an in-person meeting over two days in New York. And the Secretary General found time, along with the Deputy Secretary General, uh, to discuss with the advisory body uh, their work. Uh, this is the timeline. So uh, you've heard about the launch of the interim report. That was in December. Uh, and now we are moving to a next phase uh, of consultations, listening, engagement, deep dives into certain areas, standards work, for instance, uh, the future of work, and so on. And we'll have uh, some in-person meetings uh, and the final report to be released in the summer in time for the Summit of the Future, where a global digital compact is proposed for adoption, and AI is one of the items uh, on the agenda. Now, what's there in the report? The members will highlight some of the issues, but for you, just some preliminary idea about 
um, what the report contains. I hope you get to read it. Five guiding principles uh, to help us design international governance of AI and seven institutional functions. So the report follows um, the principle of form follows function, does not jump to a conclusion about what kind of institutional form is needed, but instead it describes the irreducible minimum functions that may be needed at the international uh, level. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, these are the guiding principles, the inclusivity principle, by and for the benefit of all. Uh, the important point about public interest, uh, then uh, the important complementarity between data governance and AI governance. We cannot look at AI governance in isolation. That's why the GDC becomes so important. If we're talking about misinformation, disinformation, and AI, we have to look at misinformation, disinformation writ large, or data governance writ large. Uh, and then uh, there is this very important aspect of networked and multi-stakeholder uh, collaboration on AI. Governments alone can't do it. Private sector alone, alone can't uh, do it. And then finally, the anchoring in our universal values in the foundations of international law. Moving on to the governance function. So these are, I'm sorry for the small text, but essentially at the foundational level, you have the important horizon scanning, building of a scientific consensus on what's the direction of technology, what are the risks and challenges emerging from it, and what are the opportunities and enablers. And then there is the important function of interoperability, aligning uh, vertically with norms and horizontally with, across jurisdictions. And then there is the issue of uh, the mediating of standards, safety, and risk management frameworks, which are proliferating in a good way across the globe. Uh, but we need to kind of build common vocabulary, uh, common understandings in that uh, space. And then, of course, the important function of capacity building, facilitating the development and deployment of uh, uh, AI across the globe. It gets more difficult as you go up uh, the slope. Uh, so the advisory body has already given some consideration uh, to this the institutional hardness uh, aspect and the difficulty of doing this. But I think options should be on the table and how we take them forward is up to uh, member states. If we go to possibly the last slide. So this is where we are today and we love to have your feedback just as we had it last time around. So the bodies engaging these existing platforms, uh, G7, G20, GPE, uh, the World Economic Forum, Partnership on AI, regional organizations, regional networks, it is, uh, its members are participating in conference such as NeurIPS, uh, engaging with specific demographics, youth for instance, uh, and coming to summits uh, like this to get feedback and uh, insights. So thank you very much to the advisory body members who are um, here with me today. And we would uh, start with Vilas, who would give us some reflection. We'll do it in two rounds. It's a slight variation on the theme that we adopted yesterday. We'll get three members of the advisory body to give some reflections. We do one round of comments and questions from the audience, and then we come back to the panel. Vilas. Hello. Thank you, Amandeep. Thank you, Gabriela. Um, thank you for that context setting and framing. I, uh, it's the end of the day and I don't have prepared remarks, so I'm just going to go for a bit. Um, I want to share with you something I've been thinking about, an individual reflection that will tie into the report. We often think of nonprofits and governments, civil society and policymakers as those who are most proximate to problems. This has become somewhat trendy, right? that often in a disaster, it's the responsibility of governments and civil society to respond, that we hold the responsibility to fix the problem. What's lacking for me is the flip side of the coin. The fact that we don't expect these very same institutions to also have the right to be proximate to the solution, to the technology itself, to understand how to actually build AI solutions. Our work in the advisory body, one of the areas focused on opportunities and enablers, the idea that AI isn't merely a conversation about risks, 
or about what we should be scared of, but how we actually productively and proactively build for a positive future. Three things came out of that analysis. First, certainly an enumeration of what we see as short-term possibilities. But second, a recognition that in order to achieve any of those opportunities, we need some enablers. And those enablers distill down to public access, to compute, to talent, to data, these fundamental building blocks on which we think about how we actually build the solutions to the world around us. And third, as a complementary part of this, an understanding that in order to realize some of that, those things do not happen at exclusively the nation state level. They happen through the creation of international frameworks and international governance that leads us into a conversation that thinks about this as a shared journey for all of humanity. So as you read the report, and I hope that many of you have, one of the things that I'll ask you to look out for is to help us as a body understand, one, where we're appropriately understanding what the real opportunities here are, to move beyond the space merely of thinking about regulatory or policy approaches that are reactive, reactive to vulnerabilities that exist or might exist, but also think about how we conceptualize public investment, how we conceptualize public conversations that are grounded in shared norms, principles, and values, like UNESCO principles, and finally, help us also understand where we're doing well and where we could do better, that give us a framework to analyze exactly what our shared readiness is for AI opportunities. The work of the body on this topic, and I'm gonna ask our colleagues to speak to some of the other kind of elements, but particularly in this space, are about an imaginative and generative view of what AI governance should look like, not merely to address short-term challenges, but to actually set forward the blueprint for what a society that actually uses these tools in very productive ways looks like. Thank you, Amandeep, and thank you, Gabriela, and thank you uh, for UNESCO and also the government of Slovenia to uh, organize this wonderful event. And I um, came here this morning, but I am already enjoying all, all the uh, discussion that is always going on here. So um, as the uh, member of this advisory board, uh, uh, I was uh, uh, also uh, in the di well, discussing with the people uh, uh, with the, uh, about the risks. And uh, it's not only the risks of uh, the AI that actually has, so, but also we also discussed about the risk of not using the artificial intelligence. So it's really important to uh, discuss the actual use cases and as a social scientist, I, I am really uh, uh, concerned and also, but on the other side, uh, not only concerned, but also ex uh, kind of excited about what kind of future, or what kind of uh, uh, effect that actually the artificial intelligence brings to us. So the, the thing is that we need to discuss not from the technology side, but we also have to discuss from the society side. So I think the main point that we should discuss is like the, what kind of society we would like to live in or what kind of uh, impacts that the, 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 the humanity uh, bring is uh, by, brought by this te new technology. So uh, by, uh, with this discussion, um, I would like to uh, uh, kind of continue on with the, uh, get the feedback from not only from this, uh, uh, the, 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 the international uh, organization from the, like, uh, not to mention uh, about the, 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 the importance of UNESCO and also the WTO or the other uh, UN family. Uh, uh, for example, the UNICRI is also discussing about the uh, impact into the, the AI, into the law enforcement. And also, uh, I am here, I am from the Japan, so the G7, uh, which the Japan chaired, and it's really uh, important to discuss about uh, the, the, how the, those guiding principles of the code of conduct uh, can be uh, used in the uh, other than the G7 uh, countries. And uh, so with this kind of international cooperation, uh, I think this UN, uh, this uh, advisory board, uh, uh, can have uh, some sort of kind of collaborative work together. And with that, uh, I would like to mention uh, one last thing is that, um, uh, so uh, it is really important to overcome the, the co-language dilemma. So the co-language dilemma is the, uh, 
uh, so, some kind of uh, thought uh, came, came up in the 1980s or so. Uh, it's like, it's saying like, it, it's really uh, difficult to predict uh, how the technology uh, influences the society before the technology spread into the society. However, once the technology is spread to the society, it, it is become really difficult to control that technology. So how, how to overcome this dilemma? And uh, I think this uh, UN advisory board, uh, uh, the, the speed uh, of you know, writing or the discussing uh, in very uh, fast way is uh, uh, to some extent answering to this question. So uh, I think it is really important to this uh, agile governance. So uh, we discuss it, uh, we put some kind of output, and then we get the feedback. And uh, with that, uh, we will actually have more uh, broader view, a more, more broader perspectives, and uh, uh, get some kind of uh, more feedback, more insight, and then we will uh, start We'll, we'll, we'll do, do the conversation with the, the wider public or the, the companies or the international organization. So in that sense, I also will me, I am really excited to hear the feedback today from the wider audiences. Thank you very much, Arisa. Now, Professor Yi Zheng. First, I would like to say that um, it's really in the UN system is really a continuous effort um, on uh, AI on AI governance in, in general. I wanted to <coughs> start it to 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 say uh, that why actually uh, within the high level advisory body, uh, I'm one of the co chair for the uh, institutions uh, building for uh, the future of AI uh, at the global level. Uh, so I think it's really uh, essential to talk, up, to talk about why we need a global institutions. Um, actually, uh, now uh, when talking about AI uh, risks, before last year, and when you compare the data before last year and the year for you know, generative AI, it's shocking to find that the number of AI risks actually has been more than 10 times compared to 2022, only for last year. So I think that that's a huge change for the world. And guess, and guess who are the winners for the number of risks worldwide? Number one, United States. Number two, China. Number three, United Kingdom. And then we actually did an analysis on the level of governance uh, from different countries. Uh, number one, United States. Number two, China. And uh, UK was also on uh, one of the top five. So what does it mean? It means for all the other, for all the countries that they have, you know, for, for these countries that have more risks they need more governance, and their level of governance actually uh, shows uh, that they're doing better compared to the other countries uh, which are without you know, higher levels of AI. And, th and then think about a scenario that now you're bringing the US, the China, and the UK AI to the undeveloped countries. What will happen? You, you're not only bringing the technology to them, you're bringing your governance model to them, which can be horrible. Because for, for them, actually, they don't need a governance model from the more developed countries. Uh, so that will never be a good institution worldwide. And also, actually, for the underdeveloped countries, Low middle income countries. Most of them, they will, been, they've been talk about, you know, that we don't have AI technologies for now. So please give us AI technologies. Please provide services. And where are the services? And now, for those super giant countries, now they're doing competitions, not really comp collaborations. So in this case, that's why we need. A, the international institution that bring all the UN efforts and also the efforts from member states all, all together to form 
and to weave a global network for AI governance. Uh, for the UN system, it doesn't mean that uh, we should have an AI agency that covers everything, and for the rest, you don't have to do anything. No, it's not. It's really that uh, we need a you know, kind of a network or agency that help to coordinate all the global, uh, all the regional trains and, and trains from member states. How can we share? It's hurt, it fundamentally hurt me when I saw some of the AI risks happen in China and then three months later, it shows up in the United Kingdom, in the United States, again and again. We don't share the story of risks. We bring risks to other countries, but we don't share the solutions to these risks. So this is why I think uh, we really need a very strong institution at the global level uh, that will help us not only to bring the right technology to more broader range, but really to coordinate, to, redu to reduce the risk right there so that it will never happen again and again all, all over the world. Thank you, thank you very much to the three members who uh, shared their reflections. And now uh, I want to open the floor um, and invite you to share uh, your comments and questions. And we'll go back to our panel in a bit. Uh, so we have some mics in the room, so please raise your hand and look for the nearest mic. Anir Chaudhry from Bangladesh. Anir. Thank you, Amandeep. Uh, a very, very interesting conversation with the reflections. Now, when I read the internet report, uh, it, it seemed to me that it was focused more on the risks and not on the labors and opportunities. Uh, Vilas talked about in the very beginning that we also want to talk about the labors and the opportunities. Now, when we talk about governance, I have two questions, actually. When we talk about governance, can we create a form of governance so that the opportunities and the enablers are also governed properly so that we can see an unleashing of innovations by private sector, with the public sector, with academia, civil society together? So, so governance, can that be an enabling form as well rather than just just containing risks, that's one question. Second is, as Bangladesh is uh, trying to develop an AI policy, we developed a guideline about four years ago, uh, just before COVID, uh, and we're now trying to develop a policy. The law minister wants to uh, enact a law. I'm trying to figure out exactly what the right combination of AI governance in a national context would be, and how we can learn from the international context so that we can provide the right governance at the right time, not stifle innovation by prematurely governing the private sector. Those are the two questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anir, for those questions. So we'll take another one. Uh, I'm Marko Grovnik. I'm from Jose Stepan Institute here in Slovenia. So otherwise I work with several bodies, right, OECD and others, right? So one, one aspect which I'm missing in the interim report, uh, which is sort of of conceptual nature, but uh, it has consequences, right? So uh, AI, as it's happening now, has uh, a perfect definition of what, uh, mathematical definition of chaos, right? So with an extremely small investment, right, uh, you can reach very large effects on various levels, right? And this chaotic nature of AI, this produced actually success, right? And also dangers uh, might uh, come out of it, right? And uh, I understand all this governance, governance structure, and it's beautifully structured. I, I must say, from that perspective, I like, I like the, the report. Uh, but this particular aspect, right, which uh, we as a scientists, right, or, or even companies uh, have trouble dealing with, right, is uh, 
exactly this uh, oh, controlling, I would say. So we are happy actually that uh, we, we can solve problems which were unsolvable a uh, year and a half ago, right? But now the cost of solving tasks which were unsolvable like uh, 15 months ago, right? Uh, uh, the cost is so small, right, that every kid can do it, right? Even without programming uh, know-how, right? So can you uh, maybe address in, I mean, you know, you were in your discussions, I know good part of the team, uh, you have smart people there. Uh, how would you address this aspect of this sort of chaotic nature of AI revolution as it's happening these days? Thank you very much. Maybe we take two more, if you don't mind. So we have a gender balance uh, back there um, and right here. Oh, okay, sorry, <laughs> confusing. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Anders Hector. I'm with the Swedish delegation, Ministry of Finance. I have a question about uh, representation and how you view representation from different uh, communities, like technical community, private sector, civil society, and so forth, and how they should participate. Uh, governments are the ones making decisions about uh, regulation, but when it comes to governance, there are different forms of uh, participating in decision making. So that would be interesting. Thank you. Vanya Škoric, uh, European Center for Not-for-Profit Law, building off that question and some of the remarks uh, that you made in the beginning. Uh, the uh, last year's KPMG uh, global study uh, showed uh, a significant decline of public trust in various AI dimensions. So connecting the question on participation and the actual building of the trust that uh, hopefully the, uh, the new governance uh, entity uh, might also contribute to. The question is how to find or have you already thought about finding innovative ways of increasing participation of various different stakeholders to showcase and demonstrate uh, directly in practice how we can all contribute to the benefit of AI. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry the mic took a while to reach you, even though you're very yeah. close to the stage. I will be very quick. Hi, everyone. Uh, Irina Nurkina, UNICEF. Um, one of the huge problems with AI risks is the question of mitigation and redress. And it's very hard to address internationally because risks can be generated in one country in the data collection, data labeling, and so on, but they will actually find the outcome or the harmful outcome will, will hurt someone in another country. How could international governance address that if it's at all possible? Thank you. Thank you so much for those questions and comments. So we will now go to Saidina and Emma and uh, you can pick which question you want to answer. Um, yeah, maybe. Okay, thank you Amandeep. Uh, if you, uh, if I can use my right to speak uh, French because the association today. <laughs> Parfait. Do you mind? Okay. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you very much, um, and thank you for uh, the many questions that are very interesting. I shall um, wait for people to get their headsets on, um, but I will try to answer the, the the question regarding the governance and how we can best tackle um, both opportunities and risks, because I think this is really what is most compelling, most important to me, what, what I'm most interested in. Um, you know, the fact that a group can be made up of many different members coming from many different horizons and contexts, and they can bring with them many different perspectives. And the fact that our group is so varied has made it possible for us to have a very broad outlook on things and to have many different categories of opportunities and uh, many different enablers regarding governance. So to me, to us, what speaks to me in all that is the fact that opportunities, the opportunities that are 
available to the most advanced countries are well known, but the fact of saying that our approach, you know, saying that AI must be used by all, means that we need governance to help less advanced countries so that they may benefit from um, the same opportunities. And when we say AI is there, we can't just be happy with saying AI exists. We need strong actions at the highest level possible, at the most global level possible, so that those countries can be taken with and won't be left on the side of the road. And having those countries on board um, in some countries, and I'd like to speak of the African countries that I know best at this stage, I think in some countries we need to go beyond just convincing um, heads of states or convincing governments because sometimes heads of states or governments or the leaders aren't um, the ones that can translate a will or, or that can really uh, make the will or satisfy the will of the population. So it's very important to have um, the, those leaders. Um, it's important to, to kind of force them to use uh, artificial intelligence. We had discussions uh, regarding um, making AI a need, like you have uh, access to water, access to uh, electricity, or access to education, and so on and so forth. Maybe we need to have access to AI as well. And a governance like that would it make it possible to have kind of an umbrella over those governments so that populations may enjoy uh, equal access. And we have seen that in terms of enablers, again, we aren't um, all at the, 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 the playing field isn't level. Through our discussions, we have seen that the most advanced countries were speaking about access to computing power. They were, they're, they're talking about access to data, but in other contexts, we have um, mostly a, a question of access to talents. So we have tried to uh, we try to have a look at all those different categories of needs, so as to be able to detect how we can best tackle those needs and satisfy those needs through our reflections. And this is why, um, I mean, this is this is what is specified also in the report. But overall, it may feel sometimes like we are speaking more about risks rather than, um, and, and we are speaking more of challenges rather than opportunities, but we try to have a look at those risks and those challenges and try to determine um, what, what the other side is, you know, what the opportunities and the enablers maybe that go together with those risks. Merci beaucoup, Sandina. And, and to, say, uh, to just add one thought to this, even in looking at the risks, the advisory body's report talks about the risks of misuse. So if you don't seize the opportunities in a good way, then you run the risks of not being able to address some issues. And I think where I would uh, draw your attention to it, the nuance in terms of, it's not just a listing of benefits that we need. Those benefits are not going to happen automatically because the deployment today is getting wrapped around existing business models. And they're not going to deliver the development boost that we need. You need new ways of bringing it together. You need to look at the enablers to realize the opportunities. And in fact, the Working Group on Opportunities and Enablers has done a great service by listing them nicely and illustrating in the case of climate change, for instance, how they actually come together. Uh, and also pointing out that there are critical international supporting functions that are needed. Uh, this kind of a distributed CERN vision that's uh, described in the uh, interim report of bringing together compute, human resource, and data across different uh, domains, different countries together to deliver on the SDGs. Um, so we will now uh, hear from Emma uh, about some of the other aspects that were raised. Thank you. Um, I want to say just two sentences on the first question. Um, I think it is also important to understand that governance in terms of this kind of technology means enabling. Because in the end, the only way in which we can ensure sustainability of this technology um, and 
that the, its benefits, it can be harnessed for the benefit of everyone is through governance. Um, and the other aspect of governance is, if you think in terms of um, you know, the, 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 the approach that we take is, is an approach of international cooperation. So it is also about thinking what, how to build the kind of AI, a global AI ecosystem that would be enabling um, for everyone. Um, that I want to focus on the difficult question on chaos I'm going to leave for somebody else. Um, but um, I want to move to the participation and the, and the trust questions. Um, and there I would want, and the redress I will also leave for someone else. Um, but so uh, practically we have, uh, we're in the process of engagement. We're in the process of consultation um, for the next few months. There is a link on the website through which people can submit comments. There is also a list of, um, Amandeep here, you have to correct me, but uh, at least 200 um, experts in the consultative network that we are going to engage with. There will be various deep dives. Um, we are looking for anybody who would like to, um, to uh, you know, invite us to talk more about this. So we are 